so thank you, Britt, and, and the Telluride Institute for having us all this weekend. I do want to clarify I'm not an expert. By trade, I'm a high school social studies teacher. So I teach psychology, economics, civics, uh, last year world history, all that kind of stuff. So um, many of the examples I'm going to give um, tie into my field and the social, human, cultural side of the mushroom. And so no real specific species we'll necessarily concentrate on, but a lot of, a lot of cool stuff. All right. Um, at the end, I will have a, a QR code, and, and my slides are freely available. I have a draft that's already on my website, um, so you can access that if you want. And, and, and I, I do try to reference all the sources that I, that I uh, include. So you're welcome to that. Share it, whatever you want to do with it. Um, and I'll, I'll revise it, so I've tuned it up a little bit since then. All right. So as far as the idea with hyper-focus, um, this, this actually ties into the second part of my title, which is a condition that I've kind of recently been self-diagnosed by, all right? And I call it MDHD. I think many people probably have it as well, and um, if, if you came here, I, I guarantee you, you've at least been exposed. So it's contagious, but not everybody gets it, you know? And what I call it is, is mycelial deficit hyperactivity disorder, all right? <laughs> And so the idea with the hyper-focus, as with many conversations you guys have had here, um, they just start going off in a direction. You lose sense of time, and uh, there, there's just so much excitement that goes with it. And so uh, we will celebrate some mycelial deficit disorder. I've got a lot of slides to get through. Um, I'm going to go, I'll, I'll touch on some. Uh, many I will probably briefly touch on and not really say much, but like I said, all of this will be accessible, or if you have questions down the road, let me know, um, but uh, that's kind of how I'm planning to do it. I'm trying to narrow the focus a bit here, and so ethnomycology as a history, as a historical field is definitely something we're going to look at, um, but many of the observations are my personal observations, okay, and so as a, as a mushroom lover, mycophiliac, I see these things everywhere. And, and even some mushrooms know my name. I mean, I, I, I don't know how that works, but I, I came across one yesterday, had my name on it, literally. So, like, so I thought that was always kind of cool. But uh, a lot of the examples I'm showing are, are just my observations. And yeah, the main intention is really just to provide a springboard for further exploration of your own. I mean, that's really what this is all about. And so as amateurs, we, we contribute greatly um, because we're out there, we're looking for things, we're finding things, and we're bringing them back, and then people who know about them or get excited about them, all right? And so that's kind of where we're at. I'm sure people are familiar with Stamets' uh, beautiful visual. Uh, and in terms of the life cycle, that is definitely important to keep in mind. Um, the question I have is, well, where do humans fit? All right, and that's really from the social science perspective, um, we're looking at the human condition, you know, in terms of the human connection that's really one piece that really hooked me when I came, when I first started coming to Telluride years ago, and it's, it just kept me interested along the way. So this long quote, I'm not going to read it, um, was given by uh, David Rose, who's a, a contributing editor to Fungi Magazine. Um, he's also been a presenter here in the past. Um, and, and basically the idea that ethnomycology does focus on uh, the social science connections, anthropology, uh, geography, uh, economics, history, but also the liberal arts. And so uh, beautiful poets and artists have uh, contributed immensely to our, our passion, right? And that's, that's why we're here, all right? Um, and so that's kind of where we're at. All right, so the first question, how do we interact, right? Um, these are my daughters who are now 19 and 16. And, and I don't see that enjoyment <laughs> anymore from on their faces when I, when I bring home a mushroom and I'm excited about it. But I mean, would you, would you see photos of people who truly appreciate uh, the fungi? Uh, there's, there's genuine enthusiasm and excitement, right? And so when we think about our connections in conversation, we always ask, well, how'd you get into mushrooms? Right, I, I, and, and, and it's always amazing to hear where people are coming from and what they're doing with it. Yesterday I met a chef that he was excited to find good edibles because he was like, uh, it, what was it, Indian fusion, and he had all, all these ideas of how to incorporate the mushroom. But, I mean, we meet people from everywhere, right? And for me, it's a learning process, all right? And, and I think for, for many novices or newcomers, um, don't feel intimidated. You know, there's a place for everybody. Even though some of the Latin names can be very intimidating, um, 
just learn. I mean, it'll take time. And if you're new, hey, you got 10 years, you got 20 years. Even amateurs and, and novices can contribute greatly, all right? Um, and so for me, I, I connected with CMS, uh, was able to have a really strong uh, support group um, and, and wealth of knowledge. I mean, that, that, that club's over 50 years old, so um, we have a lot of a lot of experience, a lot of passion, and I'm lucky to be in the Denver areas to, to enjoy it. So um, I was past president, but that's a whole other deal. In terms of other connections, I, I, had, I had some fungal connections before I really started into mushrooms. I didn't realize it. Um, I'm a former wrestling coach. Actually, I'm going to be a wrestling coach here again. And, and every now and then, we get some ringworm, right? And so in order for a, a, a student athlete to be uh, cleared, they have to go to a doctor to say it's not contagious. But fungal connections, obviously, with the biological side. Um, and I know in years past, we've had some serious medical components to, to identify all these. But that's... You know, something that's all there. Athlete's foot, all that kind of dandruff. I mean, that's fungi. Other applications, and hopefully you can read. I'm not going to read this much. Um, many industrial applications, obviously, biofuels, food, obviously. Um, and so uh, we know that fungi is very present in our lives, right? And so uh, hallucinogens are very interesting, as we'll get many talks later today to kind of emphasize mm -hmm. the the scientific significance. Um, but uh, there's a lot of different mushrooms, uh, mushroom fungi applications. And so part of what I'm looking at too from a cultural lens and social lens is the attitudes that we have, that we maybe uh, are given sometimes. Um, but uh, you know, that's definitely a big piece of it, how we think about these things and what we think about these things, all right? And so uh, we know some terms. You may, have, you may be familiar with the mycophobes versus the mycophiles, all right? Everybody here, I, I feel it's safe to say you're a mycophile. If you came <laughs> this early in the morning to listen to a talk about mushrooms, you're one of us, all right? And just to pay respect to one of the founding fathers of this festival, Manny Salzman, Beautiful man, visionary. Uh, he, he's really one we need to thank, along with Gary Linkoff and Art Good Times and many of the founding fathers to, uh, to, for being here. So, In terms of microfiles and microfiles, I don't necessarily think it's, uh, it's just, there's just two sides. It's not just a black and white issue. There's a lot of shades in between. There's micro-neutral and, 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 and other twists and turns as well, right? And so some of the examples I'll share, we'll, we'll kind of get into those things. So just culturally, uh, different regions of the world um, have different interest levels and desires for fungi, right? I'm just talking to a woman, she was a, 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 in one of the beer pubs, brew pubs uh, from Mongolia. I just asked her what kind of mushrooms are there. And she's like, well, and she actually had to look it up because she wasn't sure, but she's like, no, but people don't really eat them, they're, they're poisonous. So, all right, but poisonous doesn't mean deadly and poisonous isn't universal for everybody, but I mean, just to have those conversations, there's, it's out there, this stuff's out there, all right? Ethnomycology, just, just kind of a brief overview, and I know some of the presentations last night really did a good job uh, introducing this, so I'm kind of reinforcing some of that knowledge. Um, some of the names that are associated with the history, Schultes, if you're familiar with, uh, noted ethnobotanist, which is really the source of ethnomycology as a field. And so uh, the concept of entheogen is, is something that's really important to recognize as opposed to a drug, right? Because we're looking at something in a spiritual context, in a, in a uh, ceremonial context, um, changes the way you think about your experience, right? And so the intention is different when you take a drug versus an entheogen in a ceremonial sense. We know Wasson, the, kind of the father, the godfather of ethnomycology, um, and his uh, voyages to Oaxaca and his work with Maria Sabina helped introduce a lot of new uh, knowledge about psilocybe species specifically and psilocybin, right? And so um, in a sense, he's really indirectly responsible for much of the psychedelic revolution, or, or renaissance, I'm sorry, that we're going through right now. And so with Wasson, we know Life Magazine, uh, the term magic mushroom was created by the editors or the publisher. And so whether that did us a favor or not, who knows? But the fact is that's part of our, our, our language now. And so 
unintentionally or intentionally, I'm not sure, uh, Wasson did uh, identify these mushrooms for the world, right? For the Western world, at least. After his exposure, um, many more people became interested and curious and, and knew what to look for. And so, uh, thank you, Gordon Wasson, right? Uh, and so with Maria Sabina, to know what she was, was doing and how she was doing it is just, is just fascinating. One of her ceremonies was recorded, her velada, um, and from the research I saw that uh, she said that, that that ceremony really wasn't as effective as others, and they didn't know if it was the presence of the recording equipment or how, how that was impacted by the presence of outsiders, maybe. And so Wasson went on, published many, many books. Like I said, I mean, he really is kind of the, the person who brought attention to things like psilocybin. You know, and he worked with uh, Hoffman, the, the LSD chemist, right? And they synthesized psilocybin and psilocin, and they determined what the compounds were. And so uh, Wasson, uh, his, his interest in mushrooms was, was great. A few other figures real quick. Singer, Singer worked with Wasson and, and some of those uh, Schultes, uh, Guzman. His daughter was here a few years ago, uh, carrying on the, the mycology love. Um, I think it's also important to recognize some of the founders of this festival with their uh, ethnomycological uh, efforts. And so Manny Salzman, Gary Linkoff, they went to Siberia to learn about the Amity and Muscaria use in, in indigenous groups. And I think if you really look, it's everywhere. Right? I saw a little sticker with a Smurf on it and a mushroom just on our, somebody's garage. You know? This stuff's out there. Just keep your eyes open. But a lot, a lot of the conversations that we have um, involve you know, maybe four, kind of four types of questions. You know, people want to know what is it. That was honestly one of the things that fascinated me more than some of the other subjects. Is, well, all these Latin names, and how, how do you learn that stuff? You know, everyone wants to know, what is it? What is it? Right? Another question, can you eat it? And we know many mushrooms are very delicious edibles. Right? Um, is it deadly? And although some mushrooms are deadly, um, in Colorado, we have very few truly deadly mushrooms. So it's, uh, it's okay to touch mushrooms, even the toxic ones, and they're not going to hurt you unless you ingest it. And so uh, it is kind of, I don't know, concerning, but it's interesting to know that these things are spreading and they're being found in more places than they used to. The last question people wonder, can it get you high, right? Um, and again, again, from an entheogenic or maybe a, a therapeutic perspective, high might not be a good word. I don't know what would be better, but you know, the experiences that people have are powerful and can be challenging, you know, in quite honesty. So, um, but to, to, to know that there is uh, potential and, and that it, it, it can help people who might need help. I and mean, those are things you're gonna hear about in the next few lectures here. So the meat of this, and, and this is where my hyper-focus comes in, so I apologize ahead of time. Um, I'm gonna throw a lot of different examples from my observations, focusing on three different categories, the, the past, present, and the future, all right? And so from a social science perspective, it came to me, the, the concept of the cap. So think of the mnemonic device, the cap. And so when we look at these examples, in the back of your mind, I want you to think of the context you know, what, what's the situation that this is presented in, uh, the accuracy of the depiction. In, in the case of, of this guy, it's fairly accurate, but not, I don't think it's in your book, Britt. I don't think, I don't think that one's exactly there. And, and, and even in uh, the jumping castle I went to here, um, kids stayed out of there. I don't know why. I mean, I got in there, kids stayed out. <laughs> Maybe it was the mushrooms, but... So context, accuracy, perception, so the cap is what, what I'm going to kind of encourage you to consider, all right, just from the human side. All right, so in terms of the mushroom past, we know that many Asian cultures, and the Japanese in particular, have a true love of mushrooms, um, and this is often depicted in various art forms, uh, in this case, wood prints. Um, although they're not actually gathering a mushroom, it's, it's, uh, it's an edible and, and uh, delicacy uh, lichen. Is anybody familiar with the uh, iwataki? It's, it's actually a lichen that grows on the sides of mountains, and so it's like one of the most dangerous collections ever, but uh, 
they're there. So I've got a little clip that'll be Terence's words to uh, uh, remind us how to think about stuff. It has to do with the fact that we began to allow into our diet an exotic pseudo-neurotransmitter that was part of the native flora of the grassland. This mushroom was the triggering factor that moved us from being an advanced hominid, an advanced animal, to being, in fact, a conscious, self-reflecting, caring, thinking, dreaming, striving human being. Just having that perspective is something to just to think about, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a lot, a lot of ideas that can't be necessarily proven, but what if, right? Um, we know globally, uh, many mushroom, many fungi are, are eating specifically for food, uh, as well as eating for other purposes. This was a global source that is, is a pretty, pretty interesting one when it looks like the global uh, consumption and, and habits. Um, but we do know from scientific record, uh, there is, there is evidence of, uh, mushroom consumption from 19,000 years ago. Based on the tooth analysis or the dental analysis, and they, they, they found spores of boletes as well as agarics. And so uh, that stuff's there. Uh, you may from, be familiar with Utsi, the Iceman, um, discovered in 91. He carried with him uh, two polypores that have known value and known use medicinally. Um, as well as to, to help with fire. Um, and the fact that they were carried on almost, think of like a utility belt type setting, uh, they were important. He wanted access to those, uh, to those tools, right? Some of you may be familiar with the Algerian uh, bee man, the artist rendition, but also the original. And so we see mushroom form. Uh, without historical record, it's hard to determine whether or not it's really a mushroom, but we know it is, right? <laughs> It has to be. Cave, in, uh, some from cave art in Spain. Um, this was published a few years back. Um, but the idea here, uh, we know that some mushrooms are associated with cow dung and cattle. Those mushrooms have very specific characteristics, including bent stipes and pointed caps with umbos. Um, and so the connection is, well, is that what they are? And the fact that even ceremonially, ceremonially, uh, there's 13 of them. I mean, there's a very symbolic number uh, mythologically. We saw a lot of great examples of mushroom stones, and the unfortunate reality is they are few and far between. Uh, when the Spaniards came and the missionaries converted, these symbols were destroyed. But looking at them, I mean, the fact that they are on a base signifies or suggests that they are important. Right? Even the way the mushroom is held and, and presented, the dilated pupils, uh, the wide-eyed stare. Um, I might have seen a few of these people last night, but uh, <laughs> maybe tomorrow. <laughs> Teo uh the Aztec mushroom. Um, but I mean, if you search for, you do a, a search for Teo Teonanacatl, Aztec mushrooms, Maya mushrooms, you're gonna see many different examples and artifacts. Statue of an Aztec god, Xochipelli. This particular object had stylized images of mushroom caps for earrings, Psilocybe as, as the tecorum uh, images, all right? And so this stuff is out there. I know a few years back, this, this film was presented. You can actually stream this for free online. It really goes into uh, shamanic uh, Siberian uh, rock art. Right, and, and uh, the Amanita muscaria and the importance in the culture. All right, now this one um, really, really fascinated me. I, I came across this by accident in the, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. I was in the Americas uh, exhibit, and I, I, I saw this beautiful tapestry that had all these figures, and I'll show you some of the detail. And so it was described as a, as a shaman burial mantle, which is what the shaman, well, what the significant people would be buried and, and wrapped with. And it's also some of the earliest evidence of, of human textile 
work, um, but just beautiful. And so uh, the the bent neck and the uh, tools that are part of the of the of the shaman's uh, toolbox these are these are kind of evident. And so I, I've looked at many descriptions. Um, I've heard rattle, right? I've heard hammer. <laughs> I think mushroom, honestly, and, and, and I, I did see some research from Gordon Wasson or an interview with Gordon Wasson where he said he's seen the Paracas uh, mantles and, and he thinks they're mushrooms as well. But he said there's a caveat that, you know, just because I'm so focused on this, everything I see is a mushroom, so <laughs> just like us. Now, now, one thing that was pointed out to me that when I was sharing this with others, brown caps, right, various shades of brown, blue cap, all right? Look at the eye color. And with the blue, we've got red eyes. And we know that some psychoactive mushrooms and entheogenic mushrooms have a blue staining. I don't know, something there. Um, but the reality is that this uh, neurotropic fungi, they are distributed widely throughout the world, every continent except uh, uh, Antarctica. Um, and so they're there. And you know, then we kind of, uh, poke fun a little bit in, in some ways with, with psychoactives, but they, they play a big part in, in people's lives. And in, in, in over time, they've had uh, unknown uses, right? All right, so other past examples. This was kind of an interesting one. I don't believe it's in the most recent ones, but just for the sake of people outdoors being prepared, I, why not? It's kind of a sad connection and unfortunate. And so we know in, in many European cultures, including Germany, uh, mushroom gathering is a family tradition, all right? And so Nazi propaganda machine twists this family custom to uh, make it for their agenda. Yeah. And so very ugly, disrespectful images. And the way it was presented, this is a translation of the first page, introducing this to children. Hey, you know, you can't always identify a poisonous mushroom. And so the connection is, is unfortunate. And so I think of definitely a, an ugly, ugly way of, of, of abusing mycophilia, right? And so unfortunately, that's part of the history, right? Americans aren't uh, innocent either, right? This was one I came across, Library of Congress. Um, and this was coming in a time when the United States was just exiting a, a recession. So you think of economic problems and all that kind of stuff. Right, and so uh, Uncle Sam with Lady Liberty walking through the forest. Uh, the forest trees are labeled with rights and freedoms that we we enjoy as as uh, Americans. The mushrooms were labeled with very negative uh, connections. Right, and so I got some zoom in. I mean, you'll even see Karl Marx uh, in here. <laughs> yeah, and. And, 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 and I think, you know, maybe there's some irony here that, well, we know mycorrhizal relationships are good, <laughs> you know, not, not something that, that's going to destroy the tree, right? It's going to help the tree grow. <laughs> and so um, these are just some of the detail images that I came across. All right, so to bring us from there to the mushroom present. <laughs> Mr. Good Times, poetry. The liberal arts, I think those have always been celebrated here. I think that was part of the intention of the festival atmosphere is to celebrate all aspects. And so definitely the poem, uh, but the title awareness of what's out there right now, right? And how we look at these things right now. And so as I was kind of uh, doing a dry run and my wife was the unfortunate victim of uh, my audience, um, she said, when I brought this, hey, there's our good times. <laughs> And I was like, and I, I had this before, but she's, she, I was like, oh, yeah, that is. And so even though my wife has not contracted, I guess, my, uh, mycelial deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, she is a good spotter for me, all right? This particular example came from uh, a book fair that was hosted by her elementary school. She's a first grade teacher. And the theme was the Enchanted Forest. And so... Uh, Presenting this to children to encourage them to read. I mean, what, what, what better, right? But in terms of the mushroom, not completely accurate, but always the Amanita when, it, when in the context of children. 
there's kind of a little tongue-in-cheek psychedelic reference to the, the title of the book is How to Talk to Trees. Um, <laughs> and so that's what mushrooms can help us do. Um, there was another version of that same source that uh, the title is all about unicorns. So I think depending on the audience, um, you're kind of targeting some different, uh, some different people. All right, but always the, the, the mythical, uh, the fantastic, you know, the imaginary. I mean, that, those are a lot of things we see that are geared towards, towards children. They're fairly accurate, I think. Um, in terms of the, the portrayal of the mushroom, I don't know if rabbits hide under them, but why not? But the thing I've noticed as a teacher, I mean, students are more receptive than adults in many ways. And, and when it comes to attitudes about mushrooms, they are curious which they should be, right? And so um, I don't necessarily teach mushrooms directly, but I will answer questions if they have them. And so I had a, a, a student artist, amazing artist. Um, she wanted to, to see some mushrooms. So I gave her a mushroom book, and uh, she incorporated those into, into her, her amazing work here. And this was a 10th grade student, and I was like, man, you know? She gave me a gift with some little fungi here, and I think, uh, as an artist, she, she, she wanted reality, you know, she wanted to incorporate this stuff. And, and uh, in, my, in my classroom, I uh, unknowingly spread the spores and they take that every time they go to the bathroom. <laughs> However, not, not too many students ask, what is it? And then I tell them, if, I, if they do ask, I tell them it's a mushroom, they're like, no way. You know, so anyway. Another observation was kind of interesting geared towards students, uh, standardized testing. Right, if you're familiar with that. There was, in one of the practice books, a passage from the, for the hunt for morel mushrooms. And so, um, I think typically with, with testing types of materials, they, they try to choose things that are fairly unfamiliar so that the interpretation isn't in the context of something they might already know. And so, you know, just being exposed to a mushroom hunt, they, they got it there. Whether they actually really thought about what it, what it meant it was a whole other story. But, Kind of interesting, nonetheless. Toy stores. Saw this in Barcelona. The Disneyland parade. <laughs> um, video games. And this is an older one, but but in terms of accuracy, there 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 were accurate depictions of the mushrooms. But the good guys were the bullies, the morels, the bad guys, and and even the the spiritual warrior, the shiitake. I think that was kind of cool. <laughs> as far as eating, um, this was really a, 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 a nice connection I, I came across this summer. And th this company was well, actually a nonprofit and. Grow House, I want to say is the name, I might be mistaken. Um, they're located in the town of Globeville, which is kind of within Denver region, um, but it's also what's referred to as a, a food desert, meaning they don't have grocery stores, they don't have access to good food, all right? And so this nonprofit group is introducing uh, gourmet mushrooms to typically lower socioeconomic populations. And so I think just exposing different levels of people to healthy food, is, is really a nice, a nice thing to know, you know? And so um, th this is happening in, in conversations you've probably had or you're hearing people talk more and more about helping people with mushrooms, right? Um, on the other end of the socioeconomic uh, ladder, far west fungi, you know, if you've ever been to the ferry building in, in San Francisco, that, that is a beautiful market. <laughs> and I mean, if morels for $35 a pound, I think there were other morels for $45 a pound. So, I mean, these command uh, a, an audience, right? Costco, mass, on a mass scale. And uh, even though this isn't a real mushroom, you know, I thought just, just the connection there. We've seen Whole Foods. Another one I came across, um, and, I, and I was kind of curious about it because using medicinal mushrooms with chili pepper or chili sauce, hot sauce. And so this, this company was at a farmer's market I went to in Berkeley this summer, and, uh, and he had reishi displays, and I started looking. I was like, well, he's incorporating medicinal mushrooms with peppers and hot sauce. Um, and I don't know if there's a chemical explanation of does the capsaicin in the spice 
or in the in the peppers does that contribute to the the, the medicinal benefit of the mushroom I'm, I'm not sure we've got some great selections here did anybody try the bird's nest oh, beautiful uh the bird's nest um and if you're not familiar with the bird's nest fungi, uh, it is a true medicinal as well, and it has some anti-cancer um, properties. So Trad, I know, is going to talk more about that on Saturday, but that's one that is coming. Not all depictions are positive. <laughs> Imagine eating that thing. I think they were, they were trying to capitalize on the whole uh, psychedelic, uh, well, decriminalization in, in Denver, but I don't know if that does us any favors, but... <laughs> At the same time, it's communicating that, hey, mushrooms are here, right? This is an example that, that's pretty near where I live, and it's actually kind of an American success story. The, 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 this this uh, Savory is the last name, William Savory. Um, he was from Pennsylvania, and he wanted to raise mushrooms, grow mushrooms in Colorado, and, and everybody told him he couldn't do it, right? And so he proved him wrong. And so what's here on this historical register is... The, the last remaining evidence of his mushroom farm um, in, in suburban Denver. But uh, it's, a, it's a towering presence, literally, right? I mean, it's huge, but just seeing mushrooms, right? Uh, mushroom politics, <laughs> if you're following the, the election, we know that there are many candidates. <laughs> and, and just to be politically unbiased, we gotta pick on Republicans. And so <laughs> it's interesting, although it was pointed out to me, you know, shiitake is not growing on grass, so it's not completely accurate there. Medicinal mushrooms, we know there are so many different m more companies, so many more companies that are, that are getting involved. I, I believe this one, I saw this in Santa Cruz this summer. That was a new brand I wasn't familiar with, but that's, you know, there, there's more. We know uh, the, the, the cordyceps, the caterpillar fungi. Ancient medicine. All right, now with, with arts and entertainment, I think the, the liberal arts side, I mean, the, all, the, these are things that are incorporated in a lot of popular culture references. You know, again, the cap, think of the context. This was one I was happy to see, and Lockwood has been here uh, years in years past. If you're not familiar with Taylor Lockwood, uh, amazing mushroom photographer, uh, he, uh, his uh, bioluminescent fungi um, photos were, were incorporated into uh, uh, post-it stamps. This was another one I came across in a, when the, the new wing of the Denver Art Museum opened. I don't have the detail really well, but these are all known psychoactive species. And, and just the imagery, f fantastic. Yeah. Escher. He's more of the optical illusion artist, but and then some maybe not so much accurate. Saw this hate Ashbury a couple years ago. <laughs> Saw this in, in Barcelona. And so it was it was way far off in the distance on the roof, and I zoomed in and I mean and this uh, artist has, has installed uh, mushrooms in many different public areas throughout Europe. I'm not sure in the United States or not, but uh, just, just their presence is, is amazing. Foam, uh, brightly colored foam mushrooms. Saw this at uh, the Psychedelic Science Conference, 2017. And again, my, my wife, she's not, uh, she's, she, she hasn't uh, contracted uh, my disorder, but, but she accepts it. <laughs> Nama does have a, a registry of art, if you're curious, that they, that they have cataloged. Um, and so just to know that there are collections of mushroom art, and, and this is interesting stuff. All right, so moving from there, television. Television doesn't always do favors to mushrooms. Sometimes they focus on the sensational, uh, the inaccurate, but um, often they, they do play part of the, the, the role in, in the story or the plot. This was Law & Order SVU. And even the depiction of this guy, he was an, an eccentric, but he was growing mushrooms under black lights, and I, I don't know if it works like that, but... <laughs> But it, and even looking at this, and the magic, the, the poisonous mushrooms are actually, they look like ino, uh, Inoki. So he's like, come on. But <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't actually commit the crime. He was covering up for somebody else. X-Files, more recently. Uh, Mulder was trying to communicate with a suspect 
who couldn't talk. He, he was a burn victim, um, but he, so his idea was if he took mushrooms, he could communicate on a different level. And so this scene was part of his hallucination um, that he was, he was going through and uh, <laughs> really kind of cool. But uh, it was determined that, or his, his, uh, his partner said it was a placebo, which, uh, whatever. Anybody familiar with Hamilton? Yeah, I mean, if you have Vice, Viceland, the network, um, he's done a pretty, some pretty good jobs. I mean, his pharmacopoeia covers other psychoactive compounds, uh, but he has two shows that de deal with mushrooms specifically. Really, really, uh, fairly, I think very objective. You know, not, not good or bad, really co covers the whole spectrum. Just fascinating. Has anybody seen this in, has anybody been to the museums and seen that? Yeah, just, it's just amazing to see that and the scale of the mushrooms. Right. Mushroom images, good old Arma Brothers. Eminem. So he cared enough about mushrooms to put a tattoo, although I don't know his uh, mycology, if he's, you know, what his direct direction is, but they're still part of it. The film, you, some of you saw this this week. Uh, it's kind of documenting what we do here in Telluride in 2007, um, and definitely, a, a, you know, if you if you haven't seen it, it's a good one to, to get exposure to more about what's well, why we're here. I don't know if I'd necessarily recommend this one, but it was interesting. The film we saw last night, man, that I am, oh man, Louis, whew, yes. Yes, <laughs> and so uh, I, I think you know it's gonna, it's exciting to see that this is going to be released on a larger scale, and and how many more people are going to be connected to what what this is really all about. We know there's organizations. I always like the logos, you know, when, when they incorporate different imagery, Pikes Peak and the beautiful Pikes Peak Range, and the the, the spore prints, and so. I don't, I only have a few of the local region ones, but I know many of you are part of members of other clubs in different parts of the, of the country. There were a few years back, uh, a, a researcher had done a survey with Mushroom Club members and just wanted to know, you know, different attitudes and perceptions, how many books you own, things like that. So it's kind of cool just to see it from that angle. But really, you know, when we gather with each other, nothing matters but the mushroom, right? How we connect is the mushroom, and, and, and we come from all walks of life, all parts of the world, and we were all there for the same purpose, is to find and to learn and to collect. This was uh, last year at Ofer, we, we had a great group. And again, you know, don't be intimidated. We have novices to experts and everybody in between. So it's, uh, it's, really, it's really just get out there. Lastly, mushroom future, <laughs> space travel, right? I think some compounds can probably create the perception of the space travel, but uh, others it might be more science fiction. I don't know if anybody's seen Star Trek Discovery. There's a character that his name is Lieutenant Paul Stamets, and he's an astromycologist, right? And so they, they actually used Paul Stamets and, and his, his experience to incorporate into the into the program, and so something about a spore drive that's used to, pro to propel their their spacecraft. Ecovative, a, a company has been here uh, doing some amazing work with packaging materials. Uh, this was one I, I just uh, from their website. I didn't uh, I didn't I didn't even think about, but you know foam padding and, and cushioning. Another one that this presenter uh, came to Denver to our to our club. Uh, if you're familiar with Michael Works. Uh, mushroom leather, right? And and so this company out of San Francisco, they've developed a a, a technique to create mushroom leather. I think it's Ganoderma, um, but right now they're targeting really high-end luxury items, you know, Gucci purses and Prada and all that kind of stuff. But using mushroom materials that they can work just like leather, right? Uh, have to give a huge shout out to some new changes that were well deserved. And I know we have some members here from the Denver Psychedelic Club. Um, and decriminalize Denver and your efforts uh, and, and the momentum that that's bringing is, is really fascinating and, and, and brings a lot of hope, all right? Because we know mushrooms are not, uh, they're, they're, they're some of the safest substances. And actually this, this study was looking at the, the impact on 
other people, but also the environment. And so the, the, the lighter blue is, is that harm. And, and when you look at mushrooms, they're, they're, really, they're really not harmful. And we know the interconnectivity that, that can occur with, with psilocybin. Uh, this, was, this was presented last night as well. We are in a psychedelic renaissance, as they say, and uh, there's, there's much interest and much need for, for these, these compounds. In a clinical setting, these um, are, are being found to have great value uh, end of life treatments. You know, people who are, who are dealing with life ending disease and illness. This was, and uh, Peter Hendricks, he's going to be speaking later today. Um, I don't know if he'll mention some of this research, but they, they are working hard to try to declassify psilocybin from Schedule 1. Most of the others, all of the other studies that I'm familiar with, they use synthetic psilocybin mainly because um, you can regulate the dosage and it's easier to, uh, to work with. This is the only study I came across that they actually used uh, the fruiting body. And I think they were using the, the tamponensis, the, the, the philosopher's stone. The results suggesting that the influence or the, uh, the effect on creativity and microdosing. I mean, that's, that's something to think about. And so lastly, I, I've got some, um, some references that are more social, cultural influence. You may see these on the, you should probably see these on the book displays. But these are some of the good ones that I would recommend that, that can definitely give you more perspective. Uh, the Shroom was a great book. Really detailed work, each of these examples. Um, and like I said, I have a QR code so you can have, you, you can get all the titles if you want them. Uh, Chanterelle Dreams, Amanita Nightmares. Eugenia Bones, Mycophilia, and I, and I forget her second book, but I know she wrote another mushroom book too. Terence McKenna. Millman, he's, he's a, prof he's, I would consider him a professional ethnomycologist. He's been here. He, 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 he's done a lot of, a lot of great work. Um, is anybody familiar with this one? I mean, it, in terms of medicinal, it seems a, uh, you know, massive, but it does also include cultural, many cultural use and, and historical indigenous uses. So from a cultural standpoint, it's a, it's a good source. Fungi Magazine regularly uh, highlights uh, ethnomycological, and so Brit, are we 10 years now with fungi? 12. Okay, so it works. <laughs> so um, that was one of the issues, I guess one of the symptoms I noticed most with uh, uh, my, my CLL deficit disorder, it was uh, I started buying fungi and, and not just for the articles. So <laughs> I was told. <totally laughs> But yeah, I mean, every, every issue, you know, they, they, have, they, have a, they have a lot of good connections for us. All right. And so finally, um, I mean, we can learn a lot about each other and our relationships with the earth when we really look at how mushrooms are part of our lives. You know, and so whatever level you're at, whatever interest you have, keep going because that's, that's why we're here and that's, that's the only way it's going to continue. You know, and so... Um, to me, I think I found a real passion in, uh, in learning about these and sharing knowledge, and, uh, and I love them. So that's where we're at. And so that's the, the QR code to link you to at least a draft of this. I'll update um, some of the slides because I, I kind of tuned it up a bit over the summer. But uh, that's where we're at. Hey.